yeah, let's let's get started. Um, fortunately, I don't actually have to make sure I have the slides, which is honestly the greatest gift of them all. Um, but uh, anyway, as before, welcome. Um, but first, if you do have the chance, go ahead and turn on your video if you are comfortable, just so that, again, um, it's fun seeing the faces of people we're interacting with, um, not just the presenters, just the users. Um, at the end of the day, we, we kind of do it for the publication and the funding as well as for you. So, um, but only if you're comfortable. Um, and so Justin if, and Joe and Madeline and Simon, if you, if you can monitor the waiting room while somebody else is speaking, just so that um, people don't get stuck out there, I am guilty of leaving people out in the cold. Um, but anyway, uh, welcome everyone to this 13th workshop, something like that, uh, at, for kind of GMPS and GMPS affiliated tools. So what we'll be talking about today is um, a tool from Justin, Simon, Joe, and Madeline um, on, it's called ms to lda And so they'll tell you what all the uh, acronyms mean um, and the theory behind it. But broadly, this is another way we can start creating molecular networks as well as starting to decompose uh, MSMS spectra instead of viewing it as a full uh, molecule, taking out the components um, and start you know, visualizing, organizing, prioritizing uh, your data. So it's an incredibly powerful tool um, that we've been fortunate to be able to work together. Um, and I wanna just kind of give a shout out to all the people that, that actually did the work. I didn't actually do any of it. Um, and they'll kind of introduce themselves in turn. And so the major players are uh, Justin, as I mentioned, Jester Vanderhoof, uh, Simon Rogers, Joe Wendy, and uh, Madeline Ernst. So uh, go ahead and, you know, kind of, you guys can introduce yourselves um, and then we'll get the show on the road. Okay, let me, let me kick it off then. Hi, my name is Justin. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm an assistant professor in Wageningen at the Bioinformatics Group. And I work on um, methods to change from what we can see in metabolomics to what we actually can learn from it. So, and one of the things is of course, that we normally faced with a lot of spectra from, from our um, complex metabolite um, mixtures and how can we decompose those spectra into meaningful metabolite sets, uh, substructures, things that we can actually start to interpret at the biochemical level. Uh, hi, my name is Joe. So I work as a data analyst at Glasgow University. And I think about four years ago, uh, we met with Justin and that's how the ms 2 project was uh, born during the last year of my PhD. It's great to see that it has uh, grown to such an, to such an extent now. Hey, I'm Simon Rogers. I'm a lecturer in computing science at Glasgow University. I've done a lot of work with Justin Madeline and I was back in the day, Joe's PhD advisor. So I'm responsible for everything he's done, <laughs> good and bad. Mostly the bad one. All right. Maybe, maybe stuff in the future. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, hi, I'm Madeline. I'm a research scientist at Staten Serum Institute in Denmark. I actually haven't been part of the original MS2 LDA team, but I have worked a lot in, in recent years with uh, Justin and Simon and used MS2 LDA as well. So I'll just be helping out a bit with the workshop today and also will show you how to integrate um, the Molnit Enhancer results manually with the MS2 LDA network at, at the very end. Awesome. And I, one thing I will say um, about, especially the, the, there's, there's the original publications of tools um, and kind of the team that built it. But one of the things that um, is evident to me after, I haven't been around that long, but it's not the tool and the original publication, they of course matter, but it's the, the follow on work and the commitment to improve better document, maintain, and educate the community that really makes tools powerful. Um, and so that's something we found at GMPS. Um, it's that continued support and the people we pick up along the way that really help build into something um, more than simply the publication. So at least when I tell um, you know, new students or uh, other researchers, it's like 
the publication, especially when it comes to tools and software, that's just the beginning. You're not done it in any sense of the word. So um, I just want to kind of throw that out there. And um, especially like Madeline wasn't on the original publication, but she's been um, such, you know, such a involved collaborator um, in kind of making these, these things for MSLD as well as other things in GMPS so much better. So anyway, enough rambling from me. Um, we'll get it kicked off with Justin. Yes, so um, let me share my slides. And just so I know, can you see my slide? Yep, okay, well, so, um, before we do actually some hands-on stuff, uh, just a very uh, brief overview of the theory behind, so you understand the motivation and how it kind of works. Before we uh, uh, go to Joe, who will show you how we can actually uh, run an MSCI job on GMPS and then uh, transfer the information into the mscda.org web app that he built to uh, further explore the, the motives in there. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware of the typical metabolomics workflows that are around. I mean, I recognize many of your names uh, when I let you into the, into the Zoom meeting. So uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that most of you are familiar with such a type of workflow. Today, obviously, we, we don't really work on a very typical workflow as in the sense that we, we don't really uh, identify some selective metabolites. We actually want to do exploratory data analysis from complex mixtures. We want to understand what kind of chemistry is in there, what kind of uh, structures can be found and what kind of substructures can be found. So the objectives of today's workshop are, well, to explain the rationale behind MS2LDA, to, to actually be able to start a GMPS MS2LDA job and, and to understand roughly what the parameters mean, and also uh, to guide you a little bit in understanding how uh, the uh, substructure discovery uh, goes and how the results, how you can interpret the results. And at the end, I have to say, Madeleine will also show you how you can combine the substructure findings with the molecular network. So why, why would you do this method of mining? Why this exploratory analysis? Well, if, um, if you run an LCMS sample uh, today, and this is an example of an LCMS MS sample, you can see that we can obtain uh, thousands of fragmentation spectra within uh, uh, a few, uh, uh, this is like 24 minutes time. To be able to understand all of them um, in, in a reasonable amount of time, it needs some sort of pre-structuring. And that's where tools like molecular networking and MSLDA come in very handy. So these are two examples of, of really uh, um, well-used metal mining tools these days. So and I think most, if not all of you are very uh, familiar with GMPS molecular networking. You can see a molecular, networking of, a molecular network over here where each node is a molecule and each line is, means that the spectral similarity score between these two spectra is higher than the threshold that you put. And in that way, you can start to build your molecular families. And still, the is the tool we will focus on today. So before going into that, I just want to highlight the role of pattern mining in, in, in the data mining and the exploratory data analysis. And this is a picture that was taken not far from where Ming and, and the others are at the moment, the San Diego. And when, when I, I took the picture myself, because I immediately saw, hey, that's nice. There are two groups there, right? And I think uh, some of you have seen this slide before. but. I think it really nicely illustrates how the human brain is really focused on finding patterns. At least my brain, I can tell you that. And, um, and that it, it is really helpful because immediately we can draw conclusions about all of the members of the group. Uh, they're Where all legal, né? seals or they're all uh, seagulls. So we can exploit this grouping uh, also to, to propagate properties, right? I mean, we can then start to infer uh, properties of one group member on the others. So, um, 
what are the building blocks of metric knowledge? I mean, uh, in the picture before, in the slide before, it was clear what kind of uh, um, 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 things we saw, animals we saw, but in metabolomics, we have to deal with spectra, but actually the spectra come from structures, and in the end, the structures in a complex um, um, organic sample, they are not independent of each other. We know actually that they share biochemical building blocks. So for example, here, uh, uh, we see a flavonoid building block, and we see a sugar building block, and we know that we can combine them and create the molecules that we actually observe in, in this case, plant extracts. However, um, we don't see the structures in metabolomics data, we see the fragmentation spectra. And in the fragmentation spectra, this, this kind of uh, building blocks are represented by uh, fragments, multiple fragments or laws, for example. So then the question becomes, how can we extract that knowledge out of the spectra? And we are doing untargeted metabolomics. So a priori, we don't really know what we will find. And that's another thing that we have to keep in mind. So the motivation for Evastil DA was really that um, I studied in my PhD, like I, it took me like half a year to uh, analyze one LCMS MS file of a tomato extract. And um, that didn't look like it was really gonna uh, be very uh, sustainable, right? If it takes me half a year to do one file, then uh, you can calculate how long it will take to do 50 files. Um, so, but what I basically did is was uh, looking to find the patterns, right? Which fragments belong together and uh, which ones I can correlate to, for example, quercetin building block or camphorol or other flavonoids that are commonly occurring in, in tomato. So the rationale was then, if we can automate this, if we can find a way to automatically recognize these things, it will speed up the, the process of uh, analysis. And also it will make it, a, an, it will enable to do it at a larger scale. And finally, also, you can start to link it out to other analysis tools, like we will see today with molecular networking and MS2 LDA. So, um, MS2 LDA substructure finding uh, is like inspired by uh, natural language processing and in a particular type of, of algorithms in there, uh, topic modeling. And the LDA in it stands for uh, latent Dirichlet allocation not important for, for today's uh, talk to understand it, but just so you know, and MS2 obviously stands for MS2. And also the tool is called MS2 LDA because it also reads like uh, MS, mass spectrometry to LDA. So I hope that that makes sense now and that you will remember it from now on. Um, and how does it work? Well, if you look at the text world, we have the words over here and then we have the, the different documents and each document has sentences and in the sentence we have a lot of words and LDA will look for commonly co-occurring words across the multiple documents and it will group them into one topic. So over here the red words are a topic, the blue words are a topic, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And within the topic we can even start to count the occurrences of words. So club over here, it's, it's, it's like four occurrences whereas uh, semi-professional has only one occurrence. So that also gives you a clue about the importance. Okay, so that's very nice, Justin, but what can we do with this? Well, we can now identify the different topics in a document. And the nice thing is that you can have multiple topics in one document and also that the same topic can occur across various documents. So the blue topic here is a similar topic as the blue topic in the other document, okay? The only thing that it doesn't do for you is kind of annotate it. Like, like you, we as humans have to interpret the document, the words. And in this case, I think, I, I hope you all agree that the, the, the red words are football related, et cetera, et cetera. So when we move from the, the textual world to the metabolomics world, then the, the documents become the spectra and the words become the peaks or the losses. And again, we can identify, uh, and that's a nice thing, uh, set, uh, the same topic across multiple uh, spectra documents and also within one spectrum we can identify multiple topics and we we we, we term this topics mass to motives right so again mass from mass to motives yeah and also ms2 motives fragmentation mass maturity motives so again uh, the documents become the molecules the words become the fragments and the losses okay so of course, Justin, it's all very nice in theory. Does it work? Well, um, I, I guess you can already guess the answer. So here we have an example for uh, standards from GMPS. 
and they all share this anilin core molecule. And indeed, Emma Stolde was able to group this, uh, the spectra of this molecule into one uh, mass two motif, where these two peaks, and you can see that, that, that it doesn't need to be exactly the same pattern that it, that it finds across the multiple spectra, but they all refer back to this anilin core uh, molecule. And not only that, we see also a green loss over here. And actually, uh, that is present across multiple documents as well. And the nice thing is that that relates to this um, supery part of the analyst molecule, and that you can also see uh, attached to a different core over here. And here, the two things are combined, and they actually, we managed to build up this adenosine molecule. So, and just something about uh, LDA and then also like decomposition. So um, traditionally in the beginning, we only did unsupervised discovery using the LDA. So basically the, the, the LDA would uh, learn from the data which motives, must to motives were there. And then it's up to the user to annotate them, right? to label them with a, with a chemical uh, annotation, a substructure annotation. However, we start to build some motive sets now these days in motive DB. I will, I will shortly show that as well. And the nice thing is you can use them as a predefined motive set and add them into the mix. And then the model doesn't need to learn them. It will take them and try to find them in your data. Of course, this is much quicker, but also it, 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 will, it won't find you any novel uh, chemistry in your data. So that's the difference between like free motives and, and the predefined motive sets from motive DB. So MotiveDB very shortly. So um, this is an example of how I added motives to the, to the, to the database. So really, uh, uh, I also found motives like I hope you already did or many of you will start to do in the nearby future. So this was a motive that I, I uh, encountered from a structuremises data. I managed to annotate it using literature and trying to look up these fragments. And I found out, hey, indeed, all these different fragments, they co-occur. And, and they point to this lactone ring in this actinomycin D molecule. And I was able to do this for, uh, I think, tens of motives in the structuremycin data set. And uh, this is now one of the predefined motives that you will find in MotiveDB. So next time, if I or somebody else will run a structuremycin related data set, you can take that motive set uh, uh, with your positive mode data, you can take it, and you, you don't need to annotate all those motives again if you encounter them in your data. That's the idea behind MotiveDB, and you can all now start to contribute to that as well with your annotated motives. So just to finish up, showing very quickly that it actually works. So we, we, um, we also applied this from, uh, with, in our original PNAS paper to, uh, to several complex mixtures, including uh, some uh, Scottish and English uh, beer extracts. And over here, you can see how uh, MSLDA managed to extract some very uh, useful biochemical building blocks from there, amino acids, sugar-related things, aromatic uh, substructures. And not only that, uh, you can also apply it to urine. And actually today, we will use some urine data to show you how it all can work. And these are examples of urine substructures that I could annotate in, in a urine data set. And the nice thing as well is that it's not only the, the common building blocks that you can find, but also if you would be interested in drug metabolism, uh, here is an example of an, uh, a motive over here that's related to uh, low sartan. So it's actually a uh, sartan related uh, motive uh, that I could annotate and then use to, to very quickly pick up all the sartan related metabolites in the data. I think that was it from my side. So um, there's, there's uh, documentation about uh, uh, the GMPS MSLDA workflow on the GMPS link uh, pointed to above. And there's also the forum uh, where you can ask your questions about the GMPS MSLDA workflow. And with that, I would like to, uh, well, ask Joe to take over to show you uh, something about how to run it in GMPS and how to uh, upload it to MSLDA.org. Uh, thank you, Justin, for the nice uh, intro. Um, so in my part, I'm just going to share with you how we can take an existing uh, GNPS uh, molecular networking results and run that um, through the ms 2 LDA workflow. Oops, there you go. So the starting point of our analysis is the GNPS uh, molecular networking 
job, right? If you go to the results page, you see there'll be lots of links here. Yeah, that's a different things. And if you scroll down a bit to the bottom, so there's a section that says uh, analyze with MSQLDA. And if you click on that, so that will lead you to another page where where you can run an MSQLDA um, analysis. So you can see in the top part, the input files have been copied from the GMPS uh, molecular networking. The MGF files have been uh, transferred over. And there's a number of parameters that you might need to tweak for your data, in particular this uh, bin width that uh, tells you how big is a, is a bin that we use to look at similar trends or losses uh, across spectra. The number of iterations for LDA is a number of uh, times we, we, we repeat until convergence. I think most likely you can just uh, leave this to one as a default. You might need to adjust this uh, intensity threshold for the next two picks. And from here, you can choose uh, how many free motifs uh, that you want to discover from the data. So this section here, you can select uh, which uh, fixed motifs uh, that we can use for motif DB, as I've just been explained earlier. And once you have a uh, fill in all this, so just uh, hit submit. And the, the job will be submitted to GMPS. And after waiting for a while, you will then get the res results for, for this uh, MS2 LDA analysis. So from here, you can download the various uh, reports like this uh, motif PDF or the cytoscape data that you can view inside cytoscape. But in particular now, if you click this uh, download MS2 LDA dictionary, it gives you a file which you can then in turn upload to the ms 2 ldaorg for further analysis. So if you click the link from the previous page, and then go to our site, enter your username and password, and then click this uh, create experiment button, uh, select the file that you've downloaded from the previous section, and hit the green button. So this will upload the GMTS results to ms 2 for additional analysis. Um, and next, I'm going to show you a hands-on uh, of how this is going to work. So if you take this as a starting point, oops. can you see my screen? We still see the slide. Yeah, sorry, I need to share a different screen. Mm -hmm. So these are results from the GNPS uh, molecular networking uh, analysis. And if you just go down a bit lower, there's a small link here, analyzed with MS2 LDA. You just click on that. So that goes to um, page where you can click uh, download. And Um, sorry, so anyway, um, yeah, so there it is. You can see the input files have been transferred over from the GMPS uh, molecular networking. And to expand this field, you can adjust these parameters, including the bin width, depending on the type of data you have. And you can change some of the here. So, um, a lower number, and you can choose a which fix motif to either include or exclude. And once you have done all that, click submit, and that will eventually send you to the page where the MS the analysis has been finished. And if you click this download button here, that will give you a download page, which then lets you download the file. Additionary file. And later on, if you go to ms2lea.org, you log in here. And here the create experiment. So from this page, there, there are two ways to create an experiment. Either you upload 
your own uh, MZML or MGFL, or you can click the second tab and choose to upload the, the GMPS uh, result that uh, we have uh, done earlier. And you just click upload, so that will upload the analysis for to the msbuildia.org website. And then, and that's it to starting an msbuildia analysis. Um, I'll then uh, pass to Justin to explain to you how we can uh, interpret the results from this. Justin? Yeah, if you yeah. stop sharing your screen, I'll okay. take over. I think there's many questions in the chat, which is nice, but obviously uh, hard to follow for, for the one who is presenting. So if there's any important things that, that we should cover now, then uh, just let me know, okay? Uh, Joe or Madeline or Simon, yeah. then uh, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to do that. So just as a check, uh, do we actually see my screen. Yes. No, I don't hear no. Yes. So you know, you know, you, you normally go to uh, so you go to mlstudia.org, and then the first thing you do here, um, as with GMPS, is you need to log in. So I made a GMPS tutorial login that I will also make available uh, after the tutorial. Uh, uh, for you to go to to look at the example data if you wish and otherwise you will need to um, uh, click on the link here to get uh, yourself a personal account for those of you that don't have one yet I know that many of you have one because I, I recognized uh, some of your names so um, and this you fill in your username your password here which is for this tutorial uh, multiple omics and then we can log in and that this is the page you normally see so over here we have the uh, lda experiments and um, this is the one that joe already showed you uh, how to create from your molecular networking job so to give you some background uh, so sorry i will start with just explaining if you click on that you will see a whole lot of options so the red one is, is clear what it does. It deletes the experiment from, from your account and from the database. So uh, um, if you think it's crap or you want to redo it, then that go there. All the other blue things uh, also have some, some of uh, function. So we have the summary page, which I will go to next. We have the individual pages where you can look at the fragmentation spectra. You can look at the motives, the master motives. You can do the visualization. You can... Um, you have your experiment options and you can uh, uh, create MS1 analysis if you've also uploaded um, MS1 data. So today I will focus a bit of the summary page uh, and uh, I will focus on the master motives and I'm, in the end I will also do a visualization with you just so you know what it is and, and how it looks like. Okay, so I will push summary page. This takes a while because this is actually giving you access to almost all the, the, the data in the MS Today uh, dictionary. Um, so that's why it takes a while to load. Um, and what you will start with is the name and the details that you gave it, who has access to it, and you can also make the experiment public. So at the, at the moment, uh, this, this experiment is already public. I will share the link uh, after the tutorial in the document. And then you can directly click on the link and you will arrive at this summary page as well, just to scroll down and browse the data. You get a number of uh, uh, things to look at here. So you, you know what kind of file created this experiment. So you can see it was loaded from a dictionary. Uh, so from the model that you downloaded from GPS and a whole bunch of other things that, that could be interesting to look at, but not today. Um, so I think, the, the first thing to kind of uh, look at is, is all, uh, to, to maybe shortly also reiterate is that, um, so the concept is the same in, in terms of what kind of data you throw in it, but you need to be aware of what kind of data you throw in. This is uh, data from the Q executive, from a thermal instrument, 
So I knew it's quite uh, uh, high resolution data. So my bidding is, for example, 0.005. What, it, what does it mean? Well, all, all fragment masses within 0.005 Dalton are kind of binned into one bin. Yeah? So, um, but if you use top data, you're better off with uh, having larger bins because uh, the accuracy is a bit less and so the peaks are moving a bit more around in your fragmentation data. So that part of, of fine tuning the, uh, the, the, the bin size and the, your, your minimum MS2 kind of cut off the noise is really data set dependent. Of course, you can check what kind of settings uh, um, um, people have been using on their data that already have published MS2A results. And otherwise, if you are if you are familiar with mass spectrometry data, you can manually browse your data a little bit to check what's the best uh, minimum MS2 uh, level to use to cut off all the noise and speed up your analysis, for example. So with that out of the way, let let's have a look at the motives because today I want to really focus on on that part of of MS2 LDA just to let you understand uh, what are they, how would they look like, and what can I do with them, right? So um, you will see here that we have like 311 motors in total. And I can tell you, I took the, the GPS uh, and the mass bank and the urine motive DB data sets. So again, the difference between uh, the motive sets and the free motives is that the motive sets are predefined. And the free motives, we learn them from the data. You can recognize them by, by their motive underscore a number, right? So that means that this one is learned from the data, whereas this GPS motive seven dot M to M is a motive set motive that, that came from motive DB, and you can see it already has an annotation. Yeah. So um, basically, you can scroll here throughout the the thing, yeah, and 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 uh, look to see what kind of motives you have, and you see the degree uh, is, is 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 moving down and down and down and down. Yeah. So. However, if, if, if you are interested in the rare motives, you can swap this around and you can start from the bottom. Um, and this is also a moment to show you that, of course, we threw in a lot of uh, motives from MotiveDB, and many of which are not relevant well for this particular sample. GPS and mass bank are standards, so they also have plant, compo uh, plant standards in there. So some motives we will never find back or hardly ever find back in urine data. This is also what we see here, right? So uh, quite a few of these preset motives, they don't have any, any degree. So don't get scared of that. It's, it makes sense, yeah? We don't, we, we don't find all of that in our urine data. So, but once we go up, then we can start to see, hey, some of them are present and you can start to investigate if that is really making sense or not. So uh, we can open this motive from here, from the link in a new tab. And we can look, okay, what do we see here? Uh, uh, oh, uh, it's assigned with the loss of hexose, um, which could be an indication of hexose conjugation, for example, glucose. And we can see that this is a really, this motive consists actually of one loss of 162. And we can scroll down and we see that we have a couple of masses from over here. So there, there, there are five different masses that, that have this motive in them. And we can see over here, um, in the fragmentation spectrum plot at the bottom, how um, how there's the parent mass in blue, the the red in red, that's the uh, in this case loss from the motive. So and that is indeed 162. And then we see other fragments as well, but they are not part of this actual uh, uh, motive. So you can cycle through all the spectra. In this case, we observe every time a very strong uh, loss of 162, which could well be an indication that indeed these compounds are uh, Clark oscillator. So, of course, um, that is not the only thing I wanted to show you. So let's uh, re uh, cycle back to this one. And let's just open one uh, free motive as well. Um, now it's loading. And over here on top, we see all the different features that are part of the motive with the probability which is, a, so, which is a, a probability that that this uh, feature is part of the motive. And you can see that we always start with the top, uh, the top one, and then very quickly, usually this probability value uh, goes down. So um, over here, we see also the column magma substructure annotation. 
it is it is good to point out that we integrate the MACA with MS tilde DA, but it that only works directly for reference compounds, library molecules. So in your uh, if you have a personal account or in the, the, the Faraday discussions paper, you can find links to the GMPS and the mass bank MS tilde DA experiments. And in there we apply this magma substructure annotation. So from the standards, you can actually start to see how magma proposes uh, substructure annotations. And if there's time left, in my, but I doubt it for today, I could show you, uh, I could show you that and otherwise just go there and, and have a look. Uh, but it also means that for your data coming from complex mixtures, we cannot directly apply that method. However, when the feature here matches a feature in the mass bank data set, we show you as a kind of guide what, uh, what uh, magma annotated in the mass bank data set. So don't take these annotations for, for uh, that they're real. No, there is a guide. They, can, they serve as inspiration to, to make you think about what it could be. So this plot is, I think, a very important plot for you to look at if you want to decide whether or not a motive is, is good or, or relevant or worth exploring. So that's the, 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 the counts of the master motive features. And basically, here we see that uh, the, 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 the top loss here is occurring 20 times, then 17 times, and then 10 times. And that these two are likely to co occur at least quite, quite some times. And actually, we can then check that over here in the spectra, where we see the loss of 28, 27 CO, and then 24, uh, 42, 46. And we can cycle through, and we can see if indeed we can see, we can recognize a pattern based on the features that we just noticed on top there. And indeed, uh, uh, this combination of uh, 38 and, and what was it again? Uh, um, so we have 38, we have 46 and 74 here. So what we see over here is actually that these are kind of two different losses that seem to be combined in one mode. So fine if you're interested in one or, or two of those, but it's not a really consistent mode. So for me, I wouldn't put it uh, high on the list to further explore. Um, so if we look at, uh, oh, sorry. If we look at this one here, these are fragments uh, related to uh, glycosylation. Why? Because these are typical fragments that, that are coming from uh, um, gl uh, glucose or hexose moieties. And you can see over here that um, in the urine data, uh, actually it's a fragment 85 that is, uh, that is kind of completely picked up here. Um, and the reason that it happened is because in urine, we have a lot of acyl carnitines. And acyl carnitines, one of the, one of the masses they, they produce is 85. So that's where we have this kind of link to here, why uh, suddenly uh, MSTA tells you, oh, we have a lot of uh, glycosylation in your data. This is not true. So again, I also want to stress here, uh, um, have a look, check, and also look at, at the data here and try to see if the pattern that, that is described by this motive set is really present in your data. Um, so, and I think one of the motives is azocarotin. So we have search bu button everywhere. So you can always try to look where to find your, uh, your relevant motive. And over here, we can, oops, did I make a mistake? Azo, uh, so we have an azocarotin subset of CT and longer azo conjugates related motive. So let's have a look how that then looks. And well, we are more happy with, with that motive. Um, and actually we are, because now uh, in this motive, we see that in this uh, count of master motive features, we see that the top two, three uh, uh, features, fragment features are all consistently present in eight of, of the, out of the nine spectra. So that means that at least combination of at least two and three fragments have to be there uh, uh, all the time. And when we look down to the spectra here, we can recognize the, uh, the motive over here, right? It's always coming back in, in the peaks over here. And also some of them also have these higher peaks uh, uh, present as well. So um, that is for me a way to kind of uh, try to uh, assess if a motive is worth exploring or not, yeah, based on what are the features, 
uh, check the check the count of master mode feature plot, see if you can find some consistent presence of, of, mode, of fragments or losses, check what kind of molecules are attached, do you know already some of the masters, do you know what kind of molecules they could be, and then cycle through the spectra to see are they forming a coherent uh, kind of uh, motive in, in the actual spectra. And again, all the red is, is basically the, 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 are the, the features that are corresponding or part of the motive. Okay, so maybe uh, one more thing to, uh, um, to tell you is about the motives is that um, if we look back, then if we go to the next one and the truth is that I have no idea what's coming up now. So because uh, yeah, you have to you have to realize every time you rerun them still the A, the results may be slightly different, right? So I'm not saying uh, exactly the same, but uh, slightly different. Oh no. Um, or my internet. Did we lose Justin? Ah, I'm back. Okay. I was uh, kicked out. There we are. I think my internet was uh, was bad. Sorry about that. Um, so I didn't know what would pop up. So these are really unknown huh, motives. I just wanted to show you that uh, again, that's what I would do. And if I'm happy, uh, about it, yeah. Uh, so, for example, this one. Okay, it looks like an interesting motive. Um, I I would like to explore that further. Maybe then the way to annotate it for you is to type that in here, right? So we could say interesting motive. Um, no. And. Interesting motive, and then also not true. You can see I found a lot of interesting motives. And then you push save, and what will happen is we'll save this annotation, as you can see over here, in your uh, experiment. And later on, you are, you'll be able to, to export that uh, those annotated motives as a motive set, if you would like, to, um, to MotiveDB, so you and others can reuse your uh, the, the captured chemical knowledge that, that you that you obtained here, right? So the final thing I, I would like to do with you is to show you the visualization. So uh, I'm just going to go back to here, and then I'm going to say uh, start visualization. That's over here. So um, I'm going to put this on ten, just for the for, to make it a bit quick. So this is the minimum number of um, degrees that a, that a master motor should have to include it in the, in the network. And then you push start visualization and then depending on how many people are using the site and, 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 and internet, it should come up. Uh, there we are. Luckily it didn't take too much time today. Um, and I just want to show you that this is how that looks. So each uh, circle here is a motive, master motive. It's a square here, blue square is a molecule, basically. And again, we can, um, we can uh, hoover over the, uh, the, the circles and you can see indeed a label pops up, but we can also search. So let's say you're interested in, in drugs and, and you want to find some uh, paracetamol related uh, um, uh, motive. Ah, we have it. So methoxy paracetamol, and there we are. So we found a uh, metoxy paracetamol uh, motive. So, and the nice thing now is that, that you can go also to the, uh, to the molecules and you can also start to select the molecules. And I'm sure I, I have a different one now, but uh, uh, you, can, you can, if you're lucky enough to find it and grab it, also select it. And then um, you can see, ah, I managed. And you can see that this molecule is actually attached to three motives. One of them being, ah, I found the right one, the methoxy paracetamol, and the other one being uh, fragment ions indicative for some sort of 
uh, glutamine. So whether or not that glutamine is really in this molecule is not important for, for the tutorial today. I just wanted to show you that by selecting the molecule, you can also see which motifs are uh, found and associated to this uh, molecule. And that also means that when, when we look at this uh, map, urine map, that the motifs are a little bit grouped, right? So if, if a lot of molecules are present in two motifs, there's a higher chance that they co that they are more close to each other in this network. So that's also something nice for you to uh, to realize and, and to play with if you're interested in, in further exploring your ms 2 da results uh, using this network. It's a bipartite network, so that means that uh, each each motif is uh, not never directly um, kind of connected to another motive. So that's also important to realize. Okay, thanks for your attention. I think uh, given time, I will, um, I will move over to Madeleine um, to kind of um, show you how you can now can combine the knowledge from ms with your molecular network and create a useful cytoscape file using the MOLNET Molnet enhancer approach. So I will stop share. Thanks, Justin. I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, does that work? Uh, so yeah. you can see my screen, right? Okay, good, great. So um, we are uh, running out of time, so it will be only very short to show you how you can download the, the GNPS network with the MS2LDA data. We won't go uh, much in detail how you interpret the data thereafter. That that will be out of scope of the, the current workshop. But so basically, um, what you will do is you will go uh, to the GNPS MS2 LDA link that you created before. Um, and then you can download um, the direct cytoscape preview download. Um, I Already, already loaded this here, so you will download the cytoscape file. Um, and then to add, if you want to do that, you can also add the MOLNET enhancer output. So if you have a MOLNET enhancer job, you can open this job, um, download um, the direct cytoscape preview download or the network, um, and you also download the GNPS molecular network, so this link here, um, where you will download the graph ML for Cytoscape. And so if you do that, uh, basically you will download first the Cytoscape file of the MS2 LDA uh, GNPS integrated network, and you'll have two zip folders which you can unzip, which contains the MOLNET enhancer output and the output of the molecular network. And so if you open the network with the MS2 LDA data integrated, what you will see um, is this one. Um, so this is already nicely formatted uh, by Ming who integrated uh, style already for this. So basically the red lines would be the cosine score and the blue, blue lines would be um, the motifs um, you can also change that um, by going to the edge tab, um, then selecting stroke color. Um, and instead of edge type, you will select interaction. And then um, you cannot color them all differently. and the cosine score gray. So you'll basically see in color all the different motifs that are shared between nodes and in gray the cosine score from the original molecular network. Um, now if you want to map on top of this also um, the classes uh, retrieved from MOLNET Enhancer, you go to import table, um, then to the files you downloaded, so uh, the folder of MOLNET Enhancer that you downloaded from GNPS, it will contain a folder called Output Network. And from here, you'll import a table called Classifier Results Network 
um, txt. Um, then make sure that uh, the key is set on cluster index as this will be the column the matching will be based on and click OK. And so now you should be able to color um, the nodes based on the chemical superclasses retrieved from Molnet Enhancer. which then looks something like this. Um, if you want to also import data from the original network, like the compound ID, um, you can import the folder you downloaded from the original network. Um, and for example, import the database matches. So that would be in the results specnets db folder. Um, here, make sure that the key is on scan ID as this corresponds to the cluster index. Hit OK. And so now you also be able to, to see the original um, compound names. Um, so that's that. Okay, I think um, we went through a lot of material, um, but we're happy to take questions. I think uh, if you, if the audience, any of you want to, you know, ask questions, you can unmute yourself, um, as well as uh, for the presenters, if there's any questions you saw in the chat that you think is worth bringing up to a wider audience, um, definitely go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes. yes Good afternoon. Hi, hi everyone. So thank you very much for organizing this workshop. Uh, my name is Marinka. I'm, I'm, I'm here from Italy. That's why I wear the mask. Unfortunately, we are many people here, so uh, excuse for this. Um, I have one question that was already, I think, asked on the chat, but I would like maybe Justin could just show this. Um, is it possible to browse um, the um, data set looking for one precursor ion that we know, for example, that is a biomarker of something, but we are not sure what is this. And can we pick the um, MZ feature from the data set? So uh, there is the tab uh, fragmentation spectra. That's, I think, the one you, you would like to uh, go into then. So I, I will quickly share my screen again. I hope you will see it again. So um, basically, the, let's return. Um, well, let's go here, it's quicker maybe. So you have the fragmentation spectra details, right? So okay. in, the, in here, all the, in this case, 1,163 uh, precursor uh, masses are uh, linked. So if I'm interested in a particular mass, I can start typing it here, uh, 0 0.02, uh, it's, not, it's not existing, uh, 0.12, ah, I found it. So, um, that's one way of, of getting to a specific molecule that you know is in the data. Okay, so clicking on it, I can see all the motifs that are associated with this MSET feature. And then I can also explore the nearby environment of this feature, for example, in the network cluster. Um, in the network cluster, I think I still have it open. Uh, you can also... Uh, uh, in, sorry, in a network cluster, so say that you found uh, your, your the same mass, yeah? So now we know it's called 1842 in, in, okay. the, in the MS-28 world, then 1842, ah, we found it, search, ah, there it is. Fantastic. So network, we found it now, and you see it's linked to two motives. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, is it clear? Yes, well, it was very clear, yes. Okay. Cool. 
Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, if I if I if you find find a novel a motifs, how 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 did you uh, annotate uh, its uh, structure if it is unannotated? Yeah, that's that that's a really good question. Uh, I did not cover it in detail in uh, when I was showing you the results. So, um, well, first of all, you can use your own chemical knowledge, right? Your expert knowledge uh, that that will work in, in some cases because you know your data always better than most other people do. If you have no idea still what it could be, um, you could try to see if there's any library matches in, in if you're coming from DMPS, if, if there's any library matches in your molecular network where you can see that the motive is present and that could give you a hint of, okay, that's that structure. And if I go to the, to the spectral library behind it, whether it's DMPS or, or, or uh, a mass bank or another database, you can try to find out which mass could correspond to which part of the molecule, right? Um, and if it's part of GPS or MOSFET, you could also go to the uh, public experiment where we annotated um, where we annotated all the the masses uh, f with magma, right? So, and that could help you to actually see if if, if your molecule is there, it, it comes up with a possible kind of annotation. Yeah. So you so say finally, uh, finally uh, if that all doesn't work. You could do fragment search in, in databases like um, Cloud, Metlin, and others, right? Try to see are there other molecule, are there any reference data where these two fragments co-occur? Yeah? And that could give you a hint about what, what the substructure could be that it's pointing to. That's how I did it anyway, for, for the for the beer data set, for the urine data set that you that you look at. Uh, so you said if I click a mag magma uh uh, link, I can see if this motif is found in other, uh, like GMPS uh, data set or? No, no, I didn't say that. So you can uh, check if, if, uh, if your molecule is, is uh, if you find a library match and, and it's a molecule from GMPS or MassBank, then it may be an idea to go to the public GMPS and MassBank experiments because in there we actually have annotated, uh, uh, we have used MACMA, the Isilico tool, to annotate all the peaks and the uh, fragment peaks and the losses, um, and that could help you to kind of annotate yours then as well. That's what I said. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. So if I speculate, uh, so, uh, this motif is like some substructure. It, do you think it is possible that I buy like a few standards that they share that, that is substructure, and then I analyze it at LDA with LDA? Sure, that, that would be the best thing to do, right? Because you, if you buy standards, you also uh, add more reference spectra to, to the library. So that, that, that's, uh, you know, and you can check your own uh, annotation. So that's a win-win, I would say. So like how many standards do you think I should like get like to annotate that motif? Uh, that's really hard to say uh, based on uh, without any data or, or knowing what you're investigating. So I don't think it's, it's worth really speculating about it here. But, uh, okay. yeah. Until you find one, until you find the corrupt one, you know, yeah. it can be many. Yeah. I bought 57 and I didn't find the answer. Yeah, thank you so much. So if you know a good organic chemist, that might also help yeah, to, to kind of create a range of molecules uh, based on, on some common denominator. Yeah? Uh, I have a quick question, how you get from um, having the motifs to the classifier annotations in Molnit Enhancer. So for classifier, you need um, structures. So does that only work for the motifs of the database where you have like, or does that also work for the free motifs? Um, I think we, we're mixing up things here. So let's, um, so uh, the modern answer, it uses, uh, so, so the, the classifier terms there, they really come from the library uh, oh, okay. matches and from, uh, from the, the structural libraries, right? So based on the parent mass yeah, and, and spectrum, whereas uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the motives were found like based on the, co-occurrence of the, the peaks and the losses in the spectra, yeah? So, and um, if you go to the, to the public GPS and mass bank experiments, you will also see 
classifier terms there, but uh, to understand how they arrive there, have a look at our uh, Faraday discussions paper. Uh, so uh, we trained this uh, neural network uh, and, and using the standards and the classifier terms from the standard to kind of uh, understand um, uh, which terms co-occur uh, with, with peaks and then also with, with motives. And now you can also run predict uh, classifier terms on your data and it uses this neural network to kind of, see, okay, because based on uh, the, 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 the learn model there, we can uh, hypothesize on what is the type of uh, motive that you, you found, right? You understand? So that, that's how, how that works. So I know it's a bit confusing because it's a lot of tools that, that kind of interoperate, but uh, yeah, so that's how it works. Can I also ask another question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we, we you users, can we uh, contribute to the motives um, development by, for example, I don't know, working on the bench of standards? Um, my, my question is because I was struggling for, for a really long time with the indole family of indoles in general. And I have several uh, experiments running the indole stuff. And I also have a quite huge uh, database of indole standards. And I would like that people, you know, use it for, for their research. So can I contribute uh, significantly to the development of the motifs that also other people can use this, knowing that I am running um, or doing stuff with the indoles, and I have a lot of compounds which are pure compounds that I bought. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you could, uh, if you have the spectra for all of them, uh, yeah, you yeah, could, I you have. Could, you could run a, a small, uh, you could combine them into one file and run, run a small uh, uh, MS2 experiment, extract maybe 20 motives out of them, uh, the, 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 the most, uh, the ones that you think are, are relevant. Um, and uh, annotate them because you know the structure. So, and then you can add it as a motive set to motive DB. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, so with this maybe, and, and you also have to realize that when you, when you try to find 20 motives, probably only five or six or seven of them are gonna be really useful or relevant, right? I mean, uh, so from the original text mining uh, field there, there's some papers that say uh, uh, on average 10, uh, five to 10 to 15% of the motives you find, uh, of the, the, the topics in the text world, the motives we find are gonna be human interpretable, right? The rest will be, yeah, junk basically. So, so don't, don't, don't try to annotate all of it, just, just focus on what you think is most relevant and useful, right? So, yeah. so I, I also wanna chime in here kind of, um, but for a different point. So the fact that you have all these standards of indoles, um, what Justin is saying, definitely contribute and find the motifs for you know, the substructures you care about. But secondly, or maybe firstly, um, we would ask that if you have those standards that are run, if you can contribute the full MSMS spectrum to the spectral libraries. So first of all, this will help you never have to re-identify the same compound again. And yeah. number two, it'll help uh, kind of the MSTLDA community, they, in the same way Justin automated some of the work to find these motifs in the GMPS sets, you can, you can hope that if you put that out there, they will do it again. So you don't have to do the work of annotating it. So it's kind of twofold um, to, to support that. So e either way, I think um, having that data out there and being generous, we're very thankful, uh, but I think both doing both of these things would help tremendously. Yeah, and I think uh, 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 Madeline can uh, highlight uh, maybe some nice examples how you can layer over the MS2 LDA data onto molecular networks so that you can see, you, know, you will start to see subclusters of a certain, you know, uh, modifications uh, within that cluster. Maybe Madeline, do you have a good example you can show? And so adding the reference factor to the public domain as well as these uh, MS2 LDA tags will really be beneficial. So yeah, uh, we plan to do this as a part of the next workshop because it will be quite extensive how, how oh, okay. do these uh, 
networks with, with all the information mapped. But, but do, you, do you have one slide that you can just show for now as a teaser for next week? Well, just the screen of the slide. Yeah, if you give me just, two minutes, uh, I can do that. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for all the information. <laughs> I have a question about um, whether anybody has tried or whether there's been some thought about using MS2LDA to mine through data sets of derivatized samples. Is that I don't know, but who could be? I mean, uh, and I, I what you mean is that what, what you mean for so this? I'm thinking about, well, I'm thinking about we chemically derivatize some of our samples and that therefore we have a known motif that we would be looking for, but that motif may not make sense in the context of a broader underivatized set of sample analysis. So it's something we're artificially adding. And so I'm thinking about using that to mine through a data set, but I don't want to have that in the data set you had a broader database that may not be useful for people who are not looking at derivatized samples. Yeah, but I mean, uh, one way to, to, to deal with that is to actually uh, yeah, create a motive set and call it like, uh, 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 well, specifically mentioned that it is about derivatization motives so that people uh, that run uh, not regular samples shouldn't picket it as part of their workflow. Okay, I mean? that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for the answer. It's a great product tool. I'm looking forward to using it. Can I just so, ask, what, do, do you mean um, like motifs that you could define by hand? Yeah, I mean, we know what the mass difference is that we're looking for in terms of the neutral loss. I think it's a neutral loss. And so we, would def we could define it ahead of time and look for that particular fragment in the data set or that particular motif in the data set. Yeah, so, so Justin and I have talked before about um, adding the capability that, to allow people to actually define motifs by hand. So you could just, rather than writing them, um, it'd be cool to look at that further. Um, maybe like an email conversation or something we could have just to, sure. just to see. You, and that'd be a nice test example for us to work out how to do it. Yeah, I'd be happy to be a part of that because I think cool. it's, Great. in this case, I know exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's great. I think, yeah, we, I think that's definitely a great approach. One of the things like that might help as well in terms of just kind of validating it before any work needs to be done is kind of in the web browser for the molecular networks themselves, you can search for mass fragments and deltas within the spectrum. So it's kind of like a, a stupid version of motifs, like the simplest possible. So it doesn't have all this complexity here, uh, which mm -hmm. gives you a lot of power but at yeah. least it'll help you um, just kind of prove out the concept. And then whenever you want to do it properly in the kind of the MSTLDA kind of framework, um, you already know that it's, it's going to work. So it kind of takes a little bit of risk off the table. So anyway, that's okay. just kind of a suggestion if you want to play around with the data that you already have, if it already kind of networks together. Um, but in the cases where the motif is a very small part of the spectrum, th that's kind of off the table. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. So I have an example, uh, if you want to see that. For an integrated yes, yes, yes. molecular family. So basically this is from the um, original Molnet Enhancer publication. You can look it up, um, but what we will discuss in another workshop is how you can explore um, MS2LDA results on the network together also with in silico structure annotation or spectral library hits. So what you can see here is um, all the nodes that are here in these two groups highlighted in blue are basically um, nodes that contain motifs that we uh, annotated ourselves as being related to this typical didropine um, substructures highlighted in blue. And so we found these substructures also in the in silico structures that were predicted by um, uh, network annotation propagation. Um, then the one, the nodes that are highlighted in red, uh, we identified those as having a, a nicotinoyl side chain, which is here highlighted in red. And so basically it gives us a nice confirmation um, for the in silico structure notation that 
we see the same motifs uh, from in silico structure annotation that we also see in the motifs. So the ones that are red indeed uh, have this side chain, whereas the ones that only have the blue motif don't have this the nicotinoidal side chain highlighted in red. But cool, I, I think, um, well, thank you for all your questions. Um, and I hopefully it's, you know, it'll help you all out. Uh, definitely let us all know on the GMPS and the MS TELGA side, any kind of hiccups. Uh, we recently released a slightly new version with some bug fixes, but there's still some more um, improvements coming. Um, so we try to push out new versions every couple of weeks. So hopefully just let us know. Um, if you don't let us know, then we won't fix it. So uh, uh, you know, that's that's kind of. Uh, well, the nice of thing thing is that at least the preview works, so uh, you can see uh, 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 if there's molecular families that have uh, motives in them uh, or, or not. Yeah? So, if I recall correctly, the cosine scores are uh, uh, red, and the the, the motives are uh, the motives uh, are blue. So the edges are colored blue when there is a, mo a shared motive between two nodes uh, in a molecular family. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So um, I will say I took Justin's template for the Cytoscape style and I modified it um, in about five minutes. So it might not be the most optimal default rendering for uh, MS to LDA results. So if you have things that you think would represent a better, both from the MS LDA team as well as just you as a community, um, let us know uh, just because we just want to make it easy. Anytime you push new data through, generate new data, we want it to be super easy to just create a visualization and explore it. So this not only applies to MSC LDA, but any kind of molecular networking kind of thing. Um, we have maybe 10 styles now um, and we want to just kind of create some kind of anthology from the community that allows people to ask different questions with different visualizations, but all coming from this substructure or molecular networking kind of approach. Um, so anyway, uh, it's, it's kind of one of the things for, for us is the community feedback is super valuable. Um, but just giving- create A new style, share it with us so we can also use it and, and adopt it, right? I mean, I know it takes a lot of time to create a nice style. So if you are happy with it, then probably somebody else on the planet is also going to be happy with it. Exactly. Yeah. At least help yourself, right? If you give it to us, then there'll be a button that you can say, you can put your name on it and you can create a network and you click that and automatically applies it. So that, you know, that in and of itself will hopefully save you time. So simply, especially after you publish your paper, um, you have a Cytoscape file, simply give us a Cytoscape file. That's all we need. So, um, and we can just pull out the, the style that you actually applied. Um, so, at some point, we might write a paper on kind of a collection of different styles for different kind of applications. Um, but right now, we're just trying to make it a little bit easy. So, uh, but anyway, that aside, um, thank you for you know coming and being engaged. It really really helps. And thank you for uh, Madeline, Justin, uh, Simon, and Joe uh, for really putting the actual work into this, um, both in terms of the tool as well as the workshop. So all these things are years in the making. So. Um, one thing I, I think from, from our perspective is, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a high expectation now that software just works, um, with, even within the research community, which is not generally the reality. Um, so I, I think it's be appreciative, um, especially of their efforts, um, as well as it's helpful to cite their work, um, even though, you know, it, it it just kind of works. You're like, yeah, it's whatever. Um, but it, it really helps uh, the funding situations um, with the citations um, and showing how it's applied in different arenas. So we try to help out there with kind of these pre-written methods and citations that we recommend. Um, but you know, we, we understand mistakes happen as well as the citation limits, but as long as we're doing a good faith effort, it really helps um, everybody out. 
Um, but anyway, we'll have a follow on uh, with how MSTLDA and Mold and Enhancer will work together um, in, in the next few weeks. We haven't particularly scheduled this one out yet, but uh, we'll figure it out. There's a lot of things that are, that are coming up. But for next week, um, we actually will have a small uh, workshop on uh, rendering spectra. So there's this tool called Metabolomic Spectrum Resolver uh, that Simon approached me on, I guess, almost exactly a year ago uh, out in, uh, we were in the Netherlands. Um, and then, you know, it was, it's a fun little project, but we think it's quite powerful. Um, it's mostly being able from any kind of online analysis, rendering a spectrum, playing with the visualizations so that it's publication ready without you doing any work. Um, so a vector kind of graphics embedded in all these metabolomics resources for MSMS. Um, there's other uses that we're, 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 we kind of embedded in websites and things like that, but a bare minimum hopefully can get you to publication ready figures uh, sooner. Um, and it, it's, I, I quite like it. Um, but we'll, we'll show you how to use that um, uh, next week. And uh, that, that's also combined with a lot of the tools that won't, uh, he's on the call here somewhere, um, that he, uh, his drawing packages. So it's really a huge team um, and everything coming together and integrating together that made it happen, similar to a lot of this MSLDA and GMPS work. So uh, there's a link in the chat if you want. Yes, the link is in the chat. So it also works for MSLDA motifs. Um, so yep. that's another, another thing. So if you want to draw those, as part of your uh, as part of your results, it, it'll it should just work. Um, but anyway, definitely check out the full workflow or work workshop schedules, and we'll try to put this together in the next couple of days as a video, uh, so you can you know refer back to it or share with your friends. Um, I'm sure we went very quickly. There's things that you missed, um, and you can find us at office hours ask questions on the forum, or just stop by another workshop and at the very end, it's like, hey, I got another question for this other thing. Um, we'll be happy to, to answer those. So thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your day.